From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hi everyone, I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here. Nathan Barr has certainly been the court composer of horror royalty, from the vampire families of True Blood to the torturously fun chambers of Eli Roth and Cabin Fever, Hostel, and Hemlock Grove. In circumstances far more celebratory than Sanguine, Barr has conjured the height of fashion for Ryan Murphy with Halston and an Emmy-winning main title for Hollywood. He's also ferreted out bad behavior on both sides of the Atlantic with Russian spies who just happen to be the Americans and the not-so-proper shenanigans of a very English scandal. But among the multiple exorcisms he's performed along with touchingly dramatic road trips, trouncing the not-so-politically correct, and accompanying iconic dancers among his multi-instrumental talents that include a particular love for the Wurlitzer organ, Barr has lately had no more fun or metaphoric fear than in a barely true past of imperial Russia or steampunk fairy folk. Barr has now regaled us with a third season of the appropriately titled The Great, a profanely funny and sometimes dead serious look at the very dysfunctional rule of Catherine the Great with dazzling music that plays like Dr. Zhivago on laughing gas as it leaves no Russian melodic tradition unmangled in a land where everyone is either trying to get it on or get rid of one another. Then, in the far darker hypnotic style that combines horror, fantasy, and twisted Victoriana, Barr has drawn an impressive close to oppression besetting mythic creatures at odds with awful humans in Carnival Row. There are but two entries in an impressively stylistic repertoire that marks Nathan Barr as a costume composer unlike any other. And now here's a composer worth giving a big huzzah to. Welcome, Nathan Barr. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> well, it, it's great having you here, uh, and it's great having Catherine the Great back. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited about that. One one slight adjust in that uh, beautiful uh, intro was that I did a very British scandal, oh. not a very English scandal, which is hilarious because they decided to call season two a very British scandal, season one a very English scandal. Not sure why. Anyhow, there you go. <laughs> well, there it is. <laughs> Um, now you, you yourself have a really interesting start in world music itself. T tell me about your journey to composerhood. Yeah. I mean, I started, uh, playing cello and guitar when I was a kid and, um, I guess guitar was my rebellion against cello. And I decided that, um, I wanted to make music my life pretty early on. And then Cliff's Notes, I came to Los Angeles in 96, um, and then I went on a uh, road trip um, to Brazil. A friend and I drove a school bus from New York City to Brazil over the course of four and a half months. It was 16,300 miles, uh, 14 countries, I think, Mexico, Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Panama, and then you can't get through the Darien Gap, so we took a ferry over with our boat to Colombia. And then we drove all the way down to the southern tips of Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile to the bottom. And then I went to Antarctica for nine days, came back by boat, of course. And then uh, we drove up through Argentina to Brazil. So that was in 97. So it was my 23rd birthday, I guess, um, that I spent, or 24th, on, en route to, uh, to uh, Antarctica. Um, and then I came back here and I was running packages around town, uh, not knowing what was next. And... Um, uh, someone at uh, the the messaging service, the uh, delivery service I was working at, said, "Hey, you like film music, don't you?" And uh, they turned me on to an advert that said, "Prominent Hollywood film composer seeking driver slash assistant." So I applied for that, and um, it was Hans Zimmer, and so I worked for him as his assistant for about eight months, and then I got an agent and struck out on my own, um, and that was kind of the beginning of it. Um, yeah. 
Now, when you got the grade, uh, I mean, I just find myself like when I'm watching the show going to Wikipedia to see what actually happened. <laughs> what what is because it's mostly true. Yeah. Um, when you got this, I mean, how did you number one get get the assignment? And once you got it, did you just kind of do a deep dive into Catherine the Great and Russian music in particular? No, <laughs> I didn't. I wish I could tell you I I read like every book out there on Catherine the Great and all that, but I didn't. I. I saw with the pilot, I wrote a demo for the pilot. I think a lot of composers demoed for the pilot. And in this case, I was happy to be the one to get it. And um, Maggie Phillips, who's a wonderful music supervisor on the show, told me sort of before I wrote the demo, hey, you know, they've, they've been hearing a lot of music that's very um, sort of of the time and expected. Why don't you try something just really different, like throw out the rule book? And so I, I did something much more rooted in the synth world than even the score uh, has ended up in the show. And they really loved that. So that was a, um, um, so I guess to answer your question, going into it, I knew it was going to be something that was not a straight ahead approach to her life. Um, Tony's like a wickedly hilarious and amazing, brilliant writer. And so, rather than plugging into um, the expected sort of tropes of what one might see in a costume period drama or dramedy comedy like that, I went ahead and, and just did something different. And um, uh, we reined it in a little bit as we went on, but there, there still is quite a bit of um, anachronistic instrumentation throughout. Um, yeah. And that brings us to our first question from Ivan Sorokin. Uh, again, since the show is a satire and spoof on many Russian stereotypes, including the music, did you do any research or traditional or classical Russian music to find the balance between parody and the original kind of Russian styles for it? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that was, um, you'll hear a lot of balalaika in the score, and that's about as Russian, overtly Russian as we get. So um, the balalaika uh, being a, an instrument, a folk music in Russia, it, it plays a, a role as sort of a folk sound within the score and then within the source. There's a lot of source music that I've written um, for the show. Sometimes that stuff gets licensed. I, I felt like it'd be great to be able to write that as well as the score. So, um, so they, yeah, that was that was a that was a thing that's that's shown up quite a bit, and that really has become sort of Peter's sound when it lives in court, and then also when it shows up in the score. Um, Peter is such an outrageous character and so amazing. It's um, it's uh, interesting to uh, to use sort of a folky sound for that. Yeah. Um, how would you describe the the way the show has kind of changed? Because in the first season, we have Catherine, the, the kind of the great but very innocent girl arriving in in royal court. Are these people are going to kill her? And then the second one, she's really kind of bullied through quite a bit of that. Ep of the of that season until she finally decides to have you know have an overthrow with peter mm -hmm. and in the third one they're back in love uh, <laughs> how how did you how did you kind of see each season musically and where you wanted the music to go to kind of hit those themes i mean the music is a little bit more the, of a of a consistent player throughout than you'd normally expect so there hasn't been any a um, major discussion about having uh, carving out a new space for the music in each season. Um, Tony does that so wildly and effectively with the story and the characters. So I would almost say your, 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 your costumes, your sets and your music root the story in the time and the place. And then Tony goes off and does wild things without the score having to acknowledge that at all times. Um, so, but, but, but I guess my favorite part of the story, which you just get the, the littlest wisp of in the first episode of the first season, when she decides not to kill herself is it's this woman coming to power in, uh, in, in what was an incredibly, um, male dominated, um, political theater of, of Europe, of Russia at that time. And so I, that was such an, that's such an exciting story to tell. And so um, it was really about just uh, um, it's not even a very thematic show musically. Um, there are some themes, but for some reason, this show works really well. If you approach each scene, each little segue, each little moment um, with something somewhat unique. And I don't know why it's that way. That was just, I guess, instinct and the way it shook out. But um, 
the, the, the one of the biggest challenges of the show is that there is not a lot of score and it's divided up into many many different cues throughout each episode so it's kind of like an endurance game um, more so than other shows i've worked on um so i'll, I'll spend a couple of days working on cues and i'll be like oh man i've done this great this is great i've done 15 16 18 cues over the past two days and then i'll go to the spotting notes and it's like oh my god i have another 18 cues to go so that's that's the hardest part of this show but um it's also a pleasure so absolutely i want to give a big shout out to our friends at lakeshore records for uh, throwing us five digital downloads of the great season two so send in your questions you know the one thing that really struck has always struck me about the great essentially it's a sitcom in a way <laughs> and, the music, and the music works like you've got a zinger yeah. I mean, did it ever strike you uh in in terms of just how short the cues are but they also have to be really funny and impactful and then yeah. the jokes do, do you feel like you're scoring a sitcom it's funny you say it that way when i hear that you're you're kind of right right it's like probably some of the most famous sitcom short cues or, or the seinfeld cues right um and yeah this is this is kind of funny it is it is kind of that way uh and i think that's because again that the writing the casting the performances the direction the costumes mm -hmm. the pace the story it's all just so beautifully done this is not a show or it's a show that very rarely needs music to help sell something that isn't working um, so it's really about just, uh, gentle support and transitions. It's definitely a show of transitions as far as the score is concerned. So, um, it is a comedy. You're right. That's, that's funny. I've never heard anyone. It's like a very, I guess, I, I was going to say like a high art sitcom, but, but one of the things that's so brilliant about Tony is like, he writes these characters who are, who are functioning at so many different levels as human beings do in the real world. And yet he can get into some pretty, um, you know, pretty uh bathroom humor <laughs> and sexual humor that that uh works somehow in in the the larger scope of the story which is so brilliantly told now what's the difference musically between playing catherine and playing peter peter i would say again it's not a hugely thematic score but i would say peter is more rooted in a folk sound um he's out hunting in the forest all the time he loves hunting um, and so acoustic guitar and, and, uh, balalaika are, are, are a sound that shows up for him quite a bit. Catherine's sound lives more in an orchestral world uh, and a vocal world. So there's a boy soprano sound that I use, um, that was actually created by accident. It's funny. I, uh, uh, there's a, there's a sound, it's a, it's a three or four note motif, it's like a four-note motif, and uh, it's got this sort of unusual swoop to it, and that was because I dragged a track from one track down to the soprano track, and I forgot to mute it, and it played, and I thought, oh my god, what's that? That sounds amazing, and that's sort of become her, uh, the, the deepest part of her, which is called to rule in the best way uh, to, to Russia, um, so... That's that's kind of her sound, harps and and flute and um and then there's all the court music, there's all that stuff, and then there's, um I'm just thinking since we're on the topic of uh, character themes, um Orlo was a bassoon, very very high, and um and Velamentov is a bassoon, sort of very low, um so yeah, it's 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 a it's it's a interesting show that way. Yeah, I mean, the one thing that that really strikes me about the scoring, you could almost say it's it's pretty whimsical. That's like the one yeah. adjective that hits me. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. There's definitely a concern and a constant conversation. They never want to go too far with the score, pushing something. So if it's comedy, they don't want to be too comic. If it's serious moment, they don't want it to be too serious or self important. And so it's really a, an exercise in, in constantly uh, walking it back and pulling it back. So it's interesting to hear you say that it's whimsical because we do a lot to make sure it's not too whimsical. So hopefully it's the right level of whimsical for the for the show. OK, well, spoiler alert, the, the show has been on for well over a week, so I think I'll blow it that <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Peter yeah. takes a rather dramatic uh, exit in episode yeah. five. And I love that cue, the, the kind of voices. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thinking with the, tell me about scoring that and what's it like to lose that character? Um, well, this is in, in a way. So everyone loves Nick Holt, right? 
and everyone loves Nick Holt playing Peter. And I think one of the things that's so brilliant about what Tony's done is I don't, I doubt, I don't know anything about season four yet, but I doubt Nick Holt is going anywhere because he just doesn't go anywhere in the second half of this season, right? He's Pugachev. So you get this amazing continuance of Nick Holt's incredible performance, but just as a different character who's pretending to be the character he was when he died in the show. So I, I just think it's brilliant a bit of storytelling. And, um, uh, in terms of that scene, yeah, it, it just um, uh, there's it was so beautifully shot, right, with him just sort of sinking down into the into the depths, and so um, yeah, voices seem to to be the way to go there. Um, there honestly, there's I, I'm I'm barely remembering at this point. There's so many cues <laughs> in this show, and that might seem like a big moment, and it is, but it was just like one in a in in the race that week or that two weeks to get that episode done. And that must have been fairly difficult scoring the, yeah. the episode because essentially Catherine's in, in shell shock uh, for a whole episode after that. Uh, it yeah, was, yeah. It was particularly difficult to score because the tone really yeah. gets quite a bit more serious there. Well, it is. And what I liked is there's a choral piece at the end of s episode seven um, that acknowledges her pain. And um, so we recorded choir in England um uh it was a 24 person choir and i wrote um that piece and it was i guess it's about two minutes i think and <clears throat> the latin translates as um love until you hurts if it hurts it is good and that's that's the that's the lyric that's the libretto for that choral piece and that is one of those moments rare moments in the show where tony and marion said well let's really lean into just what she's struggling with at this point. And of course it happens over the end credits. So, um, but it's, uh, it's um, really uh, uh, a really interesting and, and beautiful moment where we, we allow the, the music to actually lean into it a bit. Now, I mean, I just love, obviously like all the episodes will end with like kind of a modern song, but in the last episode, you have like a pretty big uh, tune drop uh, with her, with her dance. Uh, what was it like navigating or did you, was there any kind of conversation with the music supervisors to, you know, how they would interact, you know, with, with your approach versus. Not too much. I mean, Maggie is a, such an amazing and successful and prolific uh, music supervisor. Um, and she's always been so incredibly supportive of the score. I'm supportive of her wherever I can be. We're, we're kind of, um, in most cases, um, she's dealing with finding a really incredible end credit song to take us out of each episode, as, as you know. Um, so, yeah, there isn't much interaction that way. Um but she's uh, I thought that 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 choice for that last episode is just so brilliant. It's just amazing. Um, I there was talk of me scoring that for a minute. Um, and I wrote something for it when she, when Elle was learning the choreography and um, they said, well, it's, it's between you and ACDC. And I thought, oh, my God, ACDC has got to be the thing. It's just so good. So I've done I've had that a couple instances. I remember in the Americans, uh, the finale for, for me, the finale of the Americans is, uh, I guess I'm biased because it was a show I worked on. But it's it's one of those shows where the uh, finale really nailed it. I just love the finale of that show. And, and that U2 song was a big part of that. And they. The Jays asked me to score that. Hey, can we see that seven minutes with your score just to see what it would be? We're probably not going to use it, but <laughs> and uh, I love those guys so much. And I love the show so much. Um, it's a big ask, and I was like, totally, whatever, it's fine. So I was basically writing something that I knew probably wouldn't work, and in a funny way, it was my way to say goodbye to the show as the composer, um, uh, knowing that it wouldn't be heard. But um, in this case, and in that case, I think the song choices are the right right choices. They're really um, made for powerful finales. Now, segueing into uh, Carnival Row, uh, which mm. had, I thought an absolutely terrific uh, second season. Um, yeah. What was it like just kind of even coming up with the sound for that show where you've got elements of fantasy, steampunk, Victoriana? How, how did you arrive at the sound for this? Yeah, I mean, so it was an interesting show because, as you may know, um, the folks who were running the show first season didn't come back for the second season. And it was a new set of folks. Uh, it was Eric Olson on uh, the, the second season. So one of the things that was 
oftentimes when that happens and there's a change of guard, um, the incoming uh, showrunner or director wants to to uh, change a lot of things. But I think Eric is is really uh, really smart and and saw um, what about the show he felt worked in season one and and wh where he should keep uh, continuance of, of the the sound uh, and and music was was uh, largely left alone in the sense that he was like I love what you did in season one let's just continue with that and to continue to develop that <coughs> excuse me in season two. <clears throat> so in terms of the sound, um, I have this world through theater organ, which um, some people know about, and uh, my studio is built around it. And so, um, you know, it's called Carnival Row, right? So <laughs> there were some, there were some very carnival elements to it, even though it's sort of a very dark uh, version of that. Um, and so there's an action sequence in season one, which leans heavily into the world through theater organ, and I'm I'm really proud of that. Um, and um so yeah just be it, it was that is a very thematic show um there are very specific themes for all the characters when the characters on screen you're hearing some version of that theme um it's a more traditional but but great approach that works really well with that show um and i used all sorts of yeah that kind of show is a, a dream for any composer from the standpoint that you've got so many um cool you're, you're creating another world and you've got so many different cool characters and th and that's going to want to be something really cool as far as the uh the, the sounds for each of those characters <clears throat> yeah now, we've got a question from louis versnelli um i really enjoyed your score to carnival row for seasons one and two on season two the cue trains and tro really blew me away can you talk about that cue and what was the thought process that went into creating it yeah, so that was a cue. So for season two, we had a huge amount of music, and I, I will, uh, um, I want to tip my hat to my uh, uh, Dimitri Smith, who worked with me on that. We also just did a show called The Diplomat together, um, and Dimitri was a, a big part of of that of season two of Carnival Row, and um, so that was one of the parts of that cue that I really love was created on. Can you see it back there? That it's right there, the hurdy gurdy. So I took that. Um, let me see if I can get it. Go get it. <laughs> so this hurdy gurdy, I thought, God, it'd be so cool to have a little action cue with a hurdy gurdy. Um, so we took, yeah, we took we took this instrument, and it's gonna sound pretty horrible right now. Probably it's a little hard to play, but. So we just did that with these keys and uh, that became this cool sound that most people would hear as a bagpipe and it's not a bagpipe, it's a hurdy-gurdy. So that was something um, that, that I recorded and then uh, Dimitri took it and we worked with it and turned it into this really cool cue. Um, so yeah, we're, we, I am really proud of that cue as well. I think it worked out really well and it's, it's such a cool sequence too, the way they shot that. Yeah, no, I loved it. And, you know, there there is essentially a crossover between the great or after the great and then the second season, because in the second season, they're fighting evil communists. So you yeah. can see there's like a, <laughs> yeah. there's a crossover with the Americans as well. There's yeah. a this Russian thing going on here. Yeah. Well, like kind of again, you know, Carnival Row when is just the metaphors are thick and heavy in that show. What was it like capturing that whole the, the revolutionary metaphor of the second season? Uh there was so, I mean, Eric, I got to tip my hat to him. He, he and his team of writers, man, they threw the kitchen sink in there. They had so much going on. They had so many storylines, so many threads. Um, and, and I think they did it really beautifully. They, it, it made for an incredibly interesting, dynamic, enormous season two. Um, and so there were some at the end of season one, as all the political happenings are, are, are going on there was a theme that was introduced there to live more orchestra and choir and so that became kind of the jumping off point for season two as those those uh storylines continued um so yeah it was really it was really just i mean there's so much music in season two um it's kind of wall to wall uh as you know um so it was a really interesting stretching themes out to work over and over again throughout the season 
Um, and Eric is very musical. He's like, he, he knows and loves music and understands its place in storytelling. So it was a, it was a, it was a challenge just the sheer amount of music. I, I bet we wrote probably, let me think about this. Uh, you know, I don't know, eight hours of music for wow. season two. Yeah. It was a lot. <clears throat> and again, I believe because of the, the, the pandemic, it actually got expanded when in fact it wasn't supposed to be. That sounds right. Yeah. I think that's yeah. right. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> Now, Carnival Row, of course, draws on your terrific horror scores that kind of really got you noticed. And that brings us to a question from Thomas Cossey. Where do you find inspiration for those horror cues while staying joyful and sane? Well, I guess it might depend on the horror film, but what do you think? So joyful, and where do you find inspiration for those horror cues? So I think what I'm assuming you mean, Thomas, is like, how do you find inspiration to write horror and then in life outside of working, find it, stay joyful and sane? <laughs> that's the case um you know it's so funny because eli is so uh we've worked together on so many films and so many people are horrified by the intensity of his films call it torture porn and all that but he he's got such a sense of humor about it so there are there are some i remember hostile 2 I, I was working on that and some friends came over and i was playing them the scene with the scythe in the bathtub and it was a husband and wife and i hit play and i was just laughing so hard because it's so over the top it's so ridiculous and i turned around and they were just both horrified and i thought oh my god i must look like a serial killer or something but Again, I think Eli and I have so much fun with the ridiculousness and the intensity of it that there's a there is a great amount of joy that goes into creating that stuff. And I mean, I remember Eli saying, I think it was the hostel, um, just that like he he wanted people who close their eyes to still suffer <laughs> <laughs> and experience what was going on on screen. And so he did that certainly with sound effects and then also with the music and um, it's always, um, Eli is again, another filmmaker who's incredibly plugged into music and the role it plays in a, in the film, especially in horror. <clears throat> so, um, it's really fun. We have a lot of fun on those films, even though they're crazy. Yeah, very, very, very true. I, I think what he did to a wiener dog from welcome to Dollhouse And the second one was truly unforgivable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, was, that was just me that's, uh, the scene, that's the scene i'm thinking of yeah exactly no it's, yeah, it's not, it's, it's pain. now we've got a question from dale um uh, most film composers don't have a cellist background in what ways has your bowling skills uh helped you carve a niche especially in your early scoring days when you played everything yourself yeah that's a great question um i don't think of myself as a great cellist there are so many great cellists in town and i don't hold a candle to any of them, but for better or worse, when I first started in the business, I was really hell bent on figuring out a way to have my own sound as a composer. And I looked at part of that as maybe performing a lot of the score too. Now I listen back to some of those scores and I'm like, Oh, I, I sort of cringe, but um, I think in so doing, you know, if as a composer, we play an instrument, um, we probably have our own style on it. And I think it's just a further way to to carve out one's niche and sense of a unique identity as a composer. And hopefully it becomes an identity that wants, um, people want to get hired by. And yeah, so Nickel Harp, uh, Guitar Viol, Drone Cello, all those. Yeah, so the, I, I do use all those. And <clears throat> um, Cello, you know, is like this. And then guitar viol is like this. And nickel harpa, you just take your two hands and move them 45 degrees. And then you can kind of do the same thing. So it's just close enough to bowing a cello that it was somewhat easy to pick up uh, in a rudimentary way. Um, but yeah, so I think, no, I, I uh, definitely, I still play here and there. But now that I have a beautiful studio and a beautiful space to record, um, and we do do a lot of recording here, um, I love using phenomenal players when i can <clears throat> yeah very true well please send in your questions to nathan uh mm -hmm. really you are kind of a, a a savior of sorts because not only have you built this incredible studio but you essentially got the Wurlitzer, the mighty bernard herman Wurlitzer organ mm -hmm. that was used in joining to the center of the earth 
and you set it up at your studio and now you're having screenings of silent movies. What what was that process like of getting that organ and installing it? I mean, I can only imagine. Yeah, it was it it was I would say the only way I could do it was was to be completely consumed and obsessed by it and I was for years. Um anything short, I think anyone who has a um purchased restored installed maintained a pipe organ uh will relate to sort of the near mania obsession that that has to come with the instrument because it's such an enormous undertaking um i didn't i had only the littlest hint of what i was up for uh what i was signing up for when i bought the instrument but <clears throat> all the studio or most of the studios in hollywood back in the early 1900s as they as they as they popped up um fox for example they all had their own pipe organs so universal had a robert morton pipe organ which is one of Worlds' competitors fox and warner brothers had uh sister Worlds theater organs like the one here um and um united artists i think had one and so there were a lot around um so <clears throat> um yeah i just wanted to to see it live live on it was it was pulled out of fox in 97 when they were doing restoration work on the stage sold off barely sold off it was almost like trash to them which is sad because it's such a piece of history um and so uh the, i bought it from the gentleman who bought it from fox in 2013 um so it was in crates from 97 to 2013 and then it was a five-year restoration as i built this building around the instrument and then we they they brought it here and, and installed it just before I did an Eli another Eli Roth film, um, House of the Clock in its Walls, which happened to be the perfect vehicle to really feature the organ. And I I did wonder when I put the organ in uh, uh, and installed it here, when would I actually get to use it? So the fact that House of the Clock in its Walls was literally recorded here with the organ a week after the studio was finished is just really a beautiful piece of uh, fate. Did you almost have to restrain yourself from being like the composer who wants to like put the that instrument into whatever he does? It's like okay, well, I do. You know, it's funny. I do. I put it in every everything, and I don't tell people I'm putting it uh, into the score until they hear it, and then they go, "Oh, that's the organ." I'm like, "Yeah, that's the organ." Because if you tell, as you can imagine, Daniel, you know, if you tell a filmmaker or a producer, oh, "I'm going to put pipe organ everywhere," they're like, "Oh, we just remembered we need to uh, not work with you anymore." Um, you know what I mean? So it's like it's 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 like a synth. It's a giant. It's a giant early 20th century synthesizer, and um, and so just just as you can sneak synth in everywhere, I sneak this this pipe organ in everywhere, and it, it's. Yeah. Was there like a moment like this as a viewer when you heard an organ in a film score and it's like, my God, I got to have this? No, uh, there was a fascination I had with pipe organs from an early age. It was there was in, my, in the church I went to growing up. I, my mom let me sit down at the console of that church organ one time and I just played some notes and it just blew my mind that somewhere else in the building up in the attic were these pipes that were making this sound i didn't know anything about it but it just fascinated me and so that was kind of the first time i i thought about it um and and then and then hearing the Wurlitzer at the orpheum uh 15 20, 20 years ago when i first got to la that blew my mind and that got me thinking about a studio with a pipe organ one day um yeah now, I'd like to mention that you, you've scored a, a remake of Salem's Lot that will hopefully be coming out sometime. Yep. Um, what can you tell us about, again, uh, with all the, 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 the story being done a couple of times before yours, mm -hmm. what, what was it like kind of going into Stephen King territory and having your own voice there? Yeah, I mean, so so this was uh, co-scored. Lizbeth Scott, my longtime uh, collaborator and friend, and I, um worked on this together so it's a, it's very much a co-score and um gary dalberman wrote and directed it gary uh wrote it um and so he's very familiar with adapting stephen king's work um and gary is just the ultimate collaborator he's like the collaborator everyone hopes for he's <clears throat> completely um uh supportive uh and excited to just sort of let who he hires do their work and then, and then, um, you know, rein it in, tailor it, help tailor it to, to get it to the place exactly that he wants. 
Um, so it was fun. It was really fun. I mean, yeah, there's really almost nothing I can say about it because it's obviously not out yet, but um, hopefully it'll be out this year. Um, we recorded orchestra and choir in New York, which is our first experience recording in New York. Um, and that was a really wonderful experience. Um, so it was, it was just a great all around experience. I've done a col couple collaborations lately with other composers. Um, and that's been fun. Um, it's such a solitary, uh, job most of the time. So to have someone else creatively involved in the room is, is really nice. And Elizabeth and I certainly were in the room together writing. I have a film coming out at Apple in July <clears throat> that I co-scored with um, uh, Damien Kulash, who was the front man from a band called OK Go. And we were also in the room uh, together uh, writing. And and that's, that was a new experience for me, but I uh, one that I really enjoyed. And I'd like to continue to do it when and, when and where I can. And um, an example of that is... Uh you know, the diplomat, which is a huge hit on Netflix. Yes, absolutely. So that was one where Dimitri Smith, who I mentioned in the, in the case of Carnival Row, he, he uh, worked for me for a number of years and I thought, okay, it's time to, to, to give it back uh, here for Dimitri, give him a shot. And so uh, the diplomat uh, came onto my plate uh, probably a year ago now or whenever it was. <clears throat> um, and, uh, yeah, and, and Dimitri and I collaborated on that from start to finish. And that was a really um, a great way to sort of, you know, I, I like to I like to try and uh, and help along um, talented younger composers, uh, as I think, you know, any any of us composers who are getting a lot of work should do. Uh, and that was that was the case for that. So and the score you're, you're talking about that's coming it's a beanie baby mania collector score, I think <clears throat> it's so it's um it's called the beanie bubble or beanie bubble. Uh, it was written um, by Kristen Gore. Um, it was directed by Kristen and her husband, Damien. And then Damien and I co-scored it. So it was like a very interesting a creative collaboration and ensemble. Uh, and Zach Galifianakis plays Ty Warner, uh, who is the eccentric billionaire who created Beanie Babies. Uh, and it's basically about the empire he built and the three women who made it possible, who he basically destroyed in the, in the process <laughs> so how do you come up with, <laughs> as, a, as a collector yeah. uh, what's it like playing uh, co collecting or just kind of going over the top <laughs> that it's funny that's interesting i didn't i you know it never even occurred to me it's such a as as anyone who knows beanie babies it was this right it was this craze uh for a matter of years and some of these stuffed animals uh, were were being sold for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, and then overnight it just collapsed and blew up. And and some of these collectibles that were worth like ten thousand dollars were worth literally nothing the next day. So it's it's about that journey, and there was something cheesy about Ty Warner that lent itself to the kind of score we ended up writing, which I don't know how much I, I'm supposed to even say about it, but anyhow, you'll hear it in the score we wrote. It's I'm really proud of the score that Damien and I um, came up with. I would, I would not have come up with it without him and he, he wouldn't have come up with it without me. It was very much a collaboration. Um, there were times where he was writing the chords, I was writing the melody and vice versa. And it was just fun to, to live in that space. And again, really challenging uh, if, if you don't have the right mentality going into this is going to be a real collaboration. And, and we did from the beginning, which is why I think it worked. And it was, it was, we just had a, we had a really good time. Now I want to start jumping back into the, you know, your fairly enormous repertoire. Um, one movie I just absolutely loved and probably has my favorite cue you've ever done is the hunt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Insane controversy over it, but i'll tell you that kitchen fight at the ending is just oh it's not amazing yeah amazing yeah. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the experience of work what happened with that the whole whole nine yards yeah yeah so the hunt was a film um that was directed by craig sobel and um everyone may remember that donald trump not having seen it uh uh called it sort of i i don't remember his exact phrase but he was saying this is the kind of violence or whatever that gets perpetrated against liberals uh, or against conservatives in Hollywood from liberals. Uh, and so all of a sudden uh, it became this um, 
probably much bigger film than it would have been otherwise, but Universal did decide to push it. So it, it was pushed, I think, six months or eight months from its original release date because of that tweet from Trump. So that was a start, interesting start to the film. Um, I had three weeks to write the score and record it and mix it and deliver it. Um, so it was a really, maybe even less. I got a call from Universal and they said, um, we have this film and, and um, we need someone to jump on it very quickly and be done with it. And, uh, you know, uh, I said, how long do you guys have? And they said, oh, we have about three weeks at best. <laughs> so, and I was like, how much music is there? And they're like, oh, it's like an hour of score. And, and I'm like, how much, uh, you know, are, are we going to be able to record it? Yeah, we're going to be able to record it. And uh, so it was a, I didn't even think twice. I just said yes, but it was a, it was insane. It was an insane turnaround time. And it was, it was so fun. And I think Craig is such a brilliant director. He went on to Mayor of Easttown, which I love. Um, and uh, it was really fun working with him. And it was interesting because he was getting death threats like during scoring. He was like, because of the political, you know, uh, uh, ramifications of it again. Then the movie finally came out and it was sort of like, oh, this is a really fun film. What's the big deal? <laughs> getting to that that kitchen, which is almost kind of like this berserker Looney Tune scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. Getting those hits, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That was the, the so there's there's a theme in there that you first hear early on, uh, and that is the theme that's sort of like being thrown around and used at the end there. Um, and again, uh, the, because there was an hour of music in, in basically two weeks, um, I had some great, great support and help there um, developing those themes to picture. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Now, I'd love to talk about your work with uh, Ryan Murphy. I mean, you've done two terrific projects with them. Uh, one, Halston, which is yep. a marvelous uh, miniseries. And, and Hollywood, which to me, I mean, with all respects to Babylon and the wonderful score, God, this to me is my favorite you know, old school Hollywood and an incredibly scored uh, series. Yeah. What, were, what were those two experiences like? They were great. They were um, Ryan Murphy's world. The, they have a very unique way of working that is just to them, just for them. And Mac Quayle, who does a lot of their shows and brilliantly is a good friend of mine. And so um, I had spent years hearing about the process and, and the, the challenges of the process, uh, yet the results that it yielded were great. And so I kind of knew enough going in to know it was going to be like nothing I had ever experienced so far as a composer in terms of the way they work. <clears throat> and when I say that, um, you basically deliver your cues to the cutting room and say a Hail Mary and then don't go back to them. <laughs> so you're probably not going to be recording them um, because um, Ryan Murphy, once he hears uh, a cue, um, if he likes it and it changes at all, and I mean at all, like mixed differently or synth instruments become real instruments, he doesn't want that. So it's, it's a real um, exercise in letting go of, of the kind of creative control that we usually try and exert over our scores to make sure what is getting into the finished pro product is getting into the finished product. <clears throat> so again, because I, because I knew from Mac sort of how they worked and interface with the cutting room, um, I, 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 I knew what I was getting into. Alexis Woodall is his right hand. And I think she's an amazing producer. I, I really enjoyed working with her. She, knows sort of what Ryan wants and she knows how to get it. Um, and she's a great collaborator. So I loved the Hollywoods. I loved being able to plug into that old style of music that I love so much. I listen to it all the time in my life. Um, that sort of late twenties, early thirties, uh, and on jazz. So I, I was so pleased that I got to write in that style. And I, and I'm really proud of that tune in the main title that won the Emmy. I, I, when even when I was writing it, I was like, this is, I think this is a pretty strong tune, you know, and, and I hope it, I hope it gets out there. And so to then win an Emmy for it was really exciting and, and validating. And then in Halston, again, you're dealing with a kind of very catty guy, you know, this world yep. of high fashion and self-destruction yep. in the eighties. 
Yeah, exactly. And that, that wanted to live, um, <clears throat> Alexis again, gives really good guidance at the top of a project. <clears throat> so Marauder, that was a reference, um, synth stuff <clears throat> when we were getting into Halston. So that sixties kind of style of synth. And so that became, um, a basis for the sound of Halston. So, um, um, and that was exciting too. It's not, I, I'm not a, I'm not a big synth composer. So it was, there was a learning curve there for me. Um, and, and again, I had some good collaborators there. Um, but it was, uh, it was a joy. It was, a, it was a joy. And I think that, I just think they're really good shows. I think, uh, I think Halston turned out great. I think Hollywood turned out great. Um, and, and, um, as, as challenging as the process could be, um, ultimately I was really pleased with, with the way it all turned out. Yeah, and another show, another kind of biopic show I'd absolutely loved was Fosse Burden. Yeah, such an amazing show. Again, and that's, so that's uh, Joel Field from the uh, from the Americans um, <clears throat> kind of brought me in on that, and that was a joy. Um, uh, uh, that was a that was a collaboration of sorts too with Alex Lacamoire, who people know from um, um, Hamilton, and I mean he's, he's sort of a, a really amazing uh, arranger, producer, composer. Um, but yeah, I thought Fosse Bird was incredible too. And that was, that, that lived sort of in jazz a bit, uh, more contemporary jazz, I guess you'd call it than, than Hollywood. Uh, but yeah, these are all, I mean, those are all dream projects for me. Like I, at the end of the day as composers, I think we just want to work on, uh, the projects of storytellers who are really good and they know how to bring it to the screen and it's going to find an audience. And if you find a au big audience and and the score is a featured part of the the show or the film it, it becomes it gets out into the world in a special way that that um uh, will probably lead to the score having a a, a a life of its own yeah i mean when you, i mean it's just really amazing when you look at just how <clears throat> prolific you are and just how many different kinds of, of styles that you've written in um uh, I mean, is that has that always kind of been the goal to kind of break out of, okay, hostile guy, you know, or, but I can do this. I mean, how difficult was it to let people know that you had this range? Yeah, it is hard. This is a town that uh, pigeonholes people a lot. Um, um, uh, I guess it's probably out of a fear of they just want to play it safe a lot of the time. So, so certainly uh, I, I was, I was doing a lot of horror scores for a long time. And that is kind of my favorite genre at the end of the day. So I love working in that world. But um, when I was doing films that weren't horror, no one was watching them. So it, it, I think one of the things that can be frustrating for composers is they may be work my, and I count myself in this, I was working in comedy and a lot of different other genres, but just the films weren't being seen by anyone. So the, you just get known for the films that the people see. And in this case, it was a lot of horror, but <clears throat> um, the great, for example, when I saw that pilot, and they said, we'll need you to write a demo. I just said, whatever I have to do to get this show. I just love that pilot so much. So I think putting the energy and the intent out there and doing what it takes to get a show um, is what breaks you out of that, that sort of pigeonholing. Now, you know, going back to the to the great to wrap up our show, yeah. I mean, one thing, again, it's so the dialogue, it's really kind of as, as lavish and awesome as the show is. It's really all kind of about the dialogue. At the, at the at the end of the day incredible and you know my dad who's uh my dad is deaf um and and so he he loves the show and he's always talking about how amazing the dialogue is it's it, he's reading it you know subtitles and um i think it's uh i'm in total agreement with you and that, and that's tony you know i mean he's just such a brilliant writer um it's 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 about as snappy and amazing as dialogue can get you know where the you know I I w there's a lot of stories with Catherine the Great. <laughs> there's like r books to go around. I yeah. mean, I can only imagine that. Hopefully, this is going to do well enough to go into season four. I I don't know how Nichols comes back unless Herbert West like finds the head that was blown out of the cannon and puts it back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's the only. I don't know how he how Nichols holds, unless he comes back like Peter the Great. Okay, oh. that, that can Pugachev. I, I mean, that's it's Pugachev. Yeah. It's all it's all going to be about Pugachev, which is so funny. <laughs> um, but but yeah, yeah. No, I I hope there's a season four too. I think it it'll be a little bit of time before we know that, but. I know everyone is hoping for it. Um, uh, it, it I think uh, Tony always envisioned it as a four season show. Um, so hopefully we will get that four season. It would be tragic if we don't, because as you know, there's some real question marks left uh, to be answered at the end of season three.
Yeah. Uh, what? Where do you hope the music? Would you like to see kind of more musically extensive sequences happen? Or I mean, I'd love to. I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, just because the show is the show, you know. And it's. Yeah. it's I, I love. Uh, we got two soundtracks out of it, uh, as you mentioned, from Lake Shore, which is great. Um, and I'm so happy we did that. And we got. Uh, it was performed uh, in Krakow, the suite, uh, a couple years ago, and so we put that on the second season soundtrack. Um, but there's probably not even enough music to create a season three um, because it's so many short cues. You'd have just like, you'd have an hour of 12, 15, 18, 20 second cues, which wouldn't wouldn't make for very interesting listening. Um, but yeah, I hope, uh, I, I, I think it's, it'll be more of the same and it's uh, totally unique in my experience so far as a composer. And that's great. Well, all I could say is who's uh, a fantastic season, a great job. And I, 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 as a mega fan, I would love to see somehow I, we can listen to lots of little cues. We just love this music. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you so much. This Thank was you. really fun. Nathan, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, joining us at Film Music Live. I want you all to watch all seasons of The Great on Hulu and Carnival Row on Amazon Prime with Nathan's scores available on Lakeshore Records and Amazon Records. A big thanks to Jana Davidoff and Alex Beck-Weinstein at Rhapsody PR. And thanks to Mark North and Mark Banning and our producer, Dale Turner. I'll be seeing you all on the next Film Music Live. Thank you.